Welcome to the Crypto Compliance Podcast by Gatenuts. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, brother. How about you? Thanks for thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be here. Welcome in my podcast. Um, listen, um, I think you know it's fantastic that you find some time to to join the podcast. Um, I think you know it's very interesting for me personally to understand the transition that you that you've done from outlier venture as the head of legal in one of the most prestige brand in the VC world into the you know Web three crazy crypto market. What's the you know what was the decision making process on your side? Sure. Um, good. Good question. I mean, so I I joined Outlier um, early 2020, um, and and prior to that, I mean, I, I've I've kind of had the the good fortune to experiment and do a lot of lot of different things in my career. But I was originally a, a, a corporate lawyer back in the day. I I describe myself now as a reformed corporate lawyer. Um, no offense to corporate lawyers out there. Um, and I actually had my own legal practice in, in London and I was working with early stage technology businesses and this was off the back of having um, co-founded um, an applied AI business actually and having kind of ridden the roller coaster as a founder and, and gotten the experience of how hard it is to, to kind of set businesses up from scratch. Um, and it was it was through that experience that I decided to kind of experiment and, and build my own business, helping other founders do exactly that. Um, that I got exposure to Web3 for the first time. Um, actually, one of my um, clients came along and they said, Chris, um, you know, I want to integrate this thing called Bitcoin into my platform. I want to accept payments in Bitcoin. Can I do that? And I said, well, uh, I have no idea, but I'm very happy to kind of go away and read about it and come back to you with some with some thoughts. And that was really when I, I guess, got bitten by the bug and, and a lot of things, you know, powerfully resonated with me. Um, and so... The step from there, where I kind of took on more and more um, Web three based projects, to joining Outlier Ventures was kind of a bit of a no brainer. Um, where Jamie at Outlier kind of approached and said, "You know, do you want to help us come and, and scale this accelerator business that we have?" And you know, when I joined, um, it was a, a much smaller organization than it is today. It was about twenty people or so, and, and we were working with sort of thirty or forty projects per annum. Um, and then while I was there, and um, I eventually joined as a partner and and became commercial director, where I was not only helping to kind of structure our accelerator programs and and our investments into into those projects, and also working directly with projects to help them think through some of the the legal and regulatory and compliance challenges you know that the entrepreneurs in Web three face every day. Um, I was also working on incepting partnerships with other ecosystems, you know, like Nia, uh, Polkadot. Um, uh, Polygon, et cetera, where, where Outlier would run cohorts that are specifically for projects building on those kind of tech stacks, basically. Um, and I loved working at Outlier and, and they're a great organization. And as you say, they have a great reputation. And while I was there, we grew it to become the, the biggest accelerator actually in Web3. Um, I also, you know, started to get a bit of an itch, having been a founder previously, to, to join a project um, full time and actually see a project kind of through grow, uh, like a long-term growth phase that you don't really get to do when you work at an accelerator. You work with teams for you know two or three months and that's it. And then you kind of say goodbye to them. You wish them well. Of course, you're there to support, but you're not following them on that journey as closely as you might like. Um, it's a bit like, you know, working, how I would imagine working in an airport feels like where you're sending all these people are kind of getting sent off on these great trips and you're always in the same place. And so I said to myself, if a really exciting project came along, um, then I would I would consider it right, and so um, the Near Foundation reached out um, in 2022, and they said, you know, Chris, we're trying to um, we're trying to uh, build the open web, and we're looking for a new GC, and would you be interested in coming and helping us do that? Um, and so I, I I took the plunge um, and kind of got into the the front lines and at the coal face, um, and I've been at the Near Foundation ever since. I'm very glad that um, you know that I made that. You know, I took that leap, um, and it was, to be completely honest, something that I had a bit of trepidation about, kind of getting onto the, into the trenches, if you will, particularly at a time when there's a lot of legal and regulatory scrutiny around the industry in general, but particularly around you know large, decentralized, autonomous, open source protocols, um, particularly those with live tokens. So, um, but but I felt that you know the open web mission in particular, which we can talk about more, is just something that is 
super um, important to me. And so, um, yeah, like I said, very glad that I that I made the switch. Um, and since since I joined SGC, I, I've actually transitioned now into into a COO role, and and I'm working with Ilya, who's the co-founder and and also the CEO of the foundation to kind of help run our organization and also support the growth and development um, of the ecosystem, which is the the foundation's kind of core purpose. So tell me more about the web, open web mission. That sounds yeah. like, you know, really, really interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. My, my, my pleasure. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked. So what we've been trying to, you know, help create at the foundation and through the, the near protocol, which is a sharded layer one blockchain protocol, but quite a bit more than that, which I can, I can come on to um, in a little bit, um, is an open alternative to the current web paradigm, right? And the, and the current web paradigm involves closed systems and permission protocols um, where, you know, data ownership and the financial upside and rewards and the governance of, of these platforms and protocols is concentrated in the hands of a very small number of, of stakeholders, right, which doesn't feel very accessible or democratic. It is also quite um, exploitative, as people know, right? So, you know, these platforms, they um, they optimize for attention and, and, and profit generation as opposed to, for example, truthfulness or integrity or quality of information. And they often use user data in ways that people don't understand or they're not told about. And I think everyone is beginning to realize that there are a lot of trade-offs that come from using the kind of current web infrastructure, as amazing as it is, to help us do the stuff that we need to do every day. And it touches you know every aspect of our life, but it does come with a lot of compromises. And we think that Web3 technology can actually um, create a better internet, an open internet where individuals can you know own their data their assets and also participate in the governance of the protocols and the platforms that they use every day um and we think that that's a fundamentally important mission um we think that you know we need to have an open web as a kind of society um thinking globally uh, if you look at a lot of the problems that we see around the world at the moment you know increasing political polarization um, increasing, um, dis, you know, um, kind of acidity and acrimony of discourse, um, and the lack of trust in, in institutions and, and indeed just trusting what, what is truth and what is, you know, what are, what, what are, what are falsehoods. Um, you know, a lot of that comes from and is driven by the types of platforms that people use to distribute and access information. And, and, um, and again, because they are geared towards, uh, profit making and attention, they tend to prioritize things that get more clicks rather than, for example, things that are truthful content. And Web three infrastructure can actually solve for a lot of those a lot of those issues. Um, so that's kind of the, the the heart of 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 what the Open Web mission is. And do you think the data data ownership and kind of creating ownership in the internet for the assets which are kind of native for for the internet is the this is the main application of Web3. I mean, what would be, in your opinion, the main application of Web3 or where is actually, you know, um, the best usage and the most innovative one for, for the big, bigger, you know, audience? Yeah. But, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, and how long do we, how long do we have um, to, yeah. like, to talk about, um, you know, use cases for Web3 technology? But I think... Well, I, I, I guess I have two two ways to answer this question. I think one way is the fundamental use case, in my opinion, for Web three technology is that it 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 enables open, permissionless, and autonomous infrastructure to actually function theoretically, perpetually, because you know you have these incentive mechanisms built into them using tokens, right? Um, you know, native digital assets of these protocols, and that's a very powerful idea, you know, the idea that you can have this infrastructure that is, you know, maintained by an anonymous, potentially anonymous group of individuals that anybody can use anywhere. You know, it's permissionless and also it tends to, it follows its um, internally logically consistent rules. That's a, that's a super powerful thing, right? And it can replace all of the, the privately owned and controlled kind of um, internet infrastructure today. So I think for me and in the context of the open web vision, that's, the most important use case. It, it allows for open permissionless infrastructure and the maintenance of that infrastructure. But specifically to I know different types of use cases, 
I mean, there are there are so many, and I think empowerment tends to be at the heart of most of them. You know, so you mentioned like data ownership is one very big one, and I think people don't necessarily they don't necessarily realize what it means to own or to not own your data, right? But like a good example that I sometimes use for people is uh, Kindle eBooks, right? When you buy a Kindle eBook, you're not buying a book, you're buying a license to that book, right? And that license has a bunch of terms on it. it often means that like, you know, your access can be canceled because I don't know, the publisher and Amazon have some kind of legal dispute, for example, and they withdraw the book. And it can even mean, and this is super sinister, but it can even mean that passages in the book can be updated and you wouldn't even be able to tell, which mm-hmm. kind of blows my mind. So you can have like your favorite book or even it could be some kind of research materials, textbook, whatever it is, right? And you could go back to something that you've underlined or- Yeah, back. James Bond, yeah. For- yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty terrifying, right? So I think, you know, creating that data ownership, but also the, these data artifacts that have irrevocable um characteristics it is also really important and really powerful. And it goes to that question that I, well, that topic I raised earlier about, you know, people struggling to find sources of truth and verified information that that they actually can can legitimately confirm are correct. And again, you know, where, I think Web3 technology has a lot of potential uses in, in that context as well. But there are also a whole bunch of others like you know, tokenization of real world assets, for example, is one very, one very kind of potentially powerful one. Um, Cross border remittances and transactions is another. You know, anything that involves the transfer of value digitally and electronically, for example, Web three technology can can do, and it can do, you know, typically more efficiently and more effectively than than the kind of Web two um, counterpart or alternative. Probably you get these questions a lot as well, and you know what. The Web3 in your opinion or crypto in your opinion is doing better than existing infrastructure. Like except, you know, open that we could I can imagine that we could put together hundreds of different companies and create open network, right? Yes. In this sense. You know, so what does it do what we don't have already um existing? Well, I think yeah, I mean there's a there's a few different there's a few different potential elements there. I mean, w- one thing is you can transfer value much more cheaply and efficiently. Um, I Native think to the thing. internet, right? In the sense that the value which do not exist somewhere else than on the internet, right? You, well, you, well, yes, but I mean, you can also, there are some real world asset tokenization platforms that exist and function currently that enable people to do things like transfer the ownership of um, you know, titled to to land, for example, and, and various other types of, of assets. Um, there's stuff happening in the UK around the tokenization, for example, of of debt interests, you know, bonds and, and other types of things. Um, and again, you can do that more efficiently and more cheaply and and in you know in a more reliable manner because you don't necessarily need a centralized um operator of a database, for example, to verify all of these things. Um and of course, you know, as a corollary, you know, you can transfer huge amounts in, in value terms, for example, of Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or, or many of these other digital assets for, for a fraction of the of the transaction costs that you would have if you were trying to move similar you know, quantums of, of fiat currency also. There are, of course, kind of compliance considerations to that, which we can come on to. But I think, again, the movement of value more efficiently is one. But I think if you're, you know, an open an open alternative to the current infrastructure, which I think is kind of where your question was was going, is you know, imagine a, um, a world in which individuals get a um, a you know completely transparent understanding of where all of their data is is online. So you can track down, you know, oh, there's some bits about my browsing behavior over here, what I like to eat over there, how much I exercise, and all you know my health data, all of this kind of stuff. You can see exactly where it all is. And you can control who accesses it, and you can actually you know be paid. You can get value when people want. To, to query or to use that data, right? And I think that is a hugely important piece of helping people, I guess, in their digital lives have a bit more dignity and control over what's being done with their data. And that question becomes even more important in the context of these AI models, which are who bring up extraordinarily large data sets, like trillions and trillions and trillions of, of, of data points and feeding them into these models. And I guarantee you that there'll be data about you and me in these models. 
for sure, because they, you know, they just scrape the entire internet. And wouldn't it be nice? And don't we think that as a kind of more reasonable quid pro quo, that every time someone runs a data set, you know, and uses one of these large language models and it has some data in there, you know, for me, I should be paid for that because they've gotten value from 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 my data, which is, you know, part of part of me. Um and maybe the last piece that I'd add before we move on is um the other element, of course, is privacy, right? And I think privacy is a complicated topic, particularly in, in, in the compliance context. But I think from from our perspective, one of the powerful things about Web3 technology is that you can get to various kind of policy and compliance outcomes that you want, which might be things like, how do I prevent illicit funds coming into my financial system, for example? Um, you can do that without having to sacrifice privacy, which is also a, a fundamentally important human right and in our view, you know, at, at, at the Near Foundation and in the, in the Near Ecosystem is a really fundamentally important human right as we move more and more things online. And we have, you know, more and more powerful things that are living online and are making use of, of data, which we should be able to keep private if, um, if, if, if we want to do that. So what's your view on the, you know, you touch on, on the AI, what's your view on the European regulations on the AI or directive on AI? You know, do you well, think it's the step to right in the right direction or the opposite? Well, I think it's at this point, it's just, it's very hard to say. I think everyone's scrabbling around trying to figure out what makes sense from a regulatory perspective, which by the way, is what they've been trying to do with Web3 for, you know, 10, 15 years, and, and there's still there's still a lot to learn and there's still a lot of work that we need to do. So I think we're at the very, very early stages when it comes to AI. Something that I that I agree with, if you think about kind of these large marquee pieces of legislation, you mentioned the, the kind of AI package, but there've been others historically that have been quite, um, you know, kind of landmark pieces of legislation, like the GDPR, for example, we were talking about yeah. privacy earlier. And I think in principle, I agree with a lot of what the legislation is intending to achieve. But I am a, I'm a bit concerned about the devil in the detail and the practical impact that some of the potential constraints might have. And you know, given that we are as an organization, you know, we support the growth and development of this open source infrastructure and ecosystem. Um, you know, any constraints on individual developers' ability to publish, um, you know, to develop and publish open source software is is just a very sensitive topic and something that should be thought through very carefully. Okay, that's very interesting. How do you, I mean, is there anyone in your foundation who is looking like how we can help projects which are rolling out or developing on near to mm. be compliant or not to fall into any traps? Yeah, you know, sure. So we have um we have a few a few different um, individuals and teams that, that that kind of help the ecosystem think about those types of things. So we have um, one team that runs what what's called Near Horizon, which is effectively um, an accelerator program. Um, we don't take um, equity in the projects either, but for any projects that are um, thinking about you know building in the Near ecosystem. I'd really encourage you to to check it out. Um, and you know, there's actually recruiting happening right now for the next cohort, um, so you, you should definitely um, have a look. But, but that's effectively a kind of fairly typical accelerator experience where you you know you'll get um, access to resources, but also to individuals like me or others in 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 the legal or, or um, um, other other teams in in um, in the foundation and and to help. You know, effectively founders set up businesses or projects typically for the first time. So the very early stage kind of uh, early stage ideas, early stage founders. Um, you also get connected to all of the other resources in the ecosystem because these decentralized ecosystems can sometimes be quite hard to navigate through and find find what you need um, where you need it. Um, so that's that's one part. And then also, you know, we have um, a great legal team in the foundation as well and. They spend a lot of time, you know, um, working with a bunch of different projects in the ecosystem. They obviously don't provide formal legal advice because we're not a, you know, we're not a law firm, and that's not what we do. But we do provide a lot of support and help. We have a great network of lawyers, accountants, and other service providers as well. There's a directory on the Near Horizon website actually where you can look at the different kind of firms and organizations that we have a preferential relationship with. Um, 
We also offer a credit system. So if you join Horizon, you get credits that you can then pay towards some of those goods and services, including you know, high quality legal advice or, or regulatory or compliance advice as well. Um, so we are, you know, we're extremely supportive and we also believe that the vast majority of founders in any ecosystem, not just ours, but in any ecosystem, you know, they want to be compliant. They want to do things in the right way. And just oftentimes it's just very hard for them to understand and know what, what indeed is the appropriate path forwards because there's lots of different information out there. There's lots of sometimes misinformation, to be honest as well, about what is or what isn't permitted. Um, and I think in some cases there are there's an unfortunate level of uncertainty around how how these types of activities, how these types of assets are regulated um, in different jurisdictions globally. And by their nature, these types of technologies, they're, you know, as as we talked about, they're permissionless, accessible from any jurisdiction anywhere. It's um, it creates lots of legal and regulatory complexity. And if you're a first time founder, all you really want to do is just build your great product, right? You don't necessarily want to have to get bogged down in hiring lots of expensive lawyers and and you know getting reams of opinions about you know what you can do in this jurisdiction versus yeah. that one. It's not very feasible. So I think which which brings back to my point about you know there's just a lot of work still to do on the regulatory front and frankly the compliance front because those two things are obviously very heavily interlinked. Um, to make it easier for people to build in Web3. So from this perspective, and considering that NIR is, you know, global, and we probably have, you know, from every part of the world projects coming in, where would you say is the most friendly or promising uh, regulatory ecosystem in the world? Yeah, that's Obviously a great... We have, you know, Mika, we have US, Singapore, Dubai, and you yeah, have, sure. you know, constantly changing, you know, where to put your project. So, I mean, it's a great question. Um, and unsurprisingly, it's a, qu a question I get asked a lot. Um, and I'm a bit biased because we're, so the foundation's based, we're headquartered in Switzerland, in, in, yeah. Zug, in Switzerland. So I think Switzerland has had for a number of years since 2017 when it introduced its, um, its ICO framework, um, a very forward thinking and flexible regime around digital assets. And FINMA, who is the Swiss financial regulator, is you know, super open to to kind of good faith conversations and dialogue. You know, they want to understand and learn more. They want to understand how to make their frameworks as flexible, but also as robust as possible and, and ensuring that we're getting good policy outcomes, but we're also enabling innovation. Mm. So yeah, Switzerland is, is fantastic. And for, depending on what you want to do, there's lots of um, flexibility and also interesting legal structures like the foundation model. There's also the association model, which is more light touch, but kind of similar basically allows you to create um, what's called an orphan entity. So an entity that doesn't have any stakeholders or owners to then administer these um, open and decentralized ecosystems. Um, but yeah, Switzerland is just, it's just one jurisdiction. There are plenty of others that are doing lots of great work. I think um, Bermuda is another one that we actually, um, we have a lot of close ties with and we do a lot of work um, on, on the island. And, and there's actually a, a Bermuda Tech Summit conference coming up in a few weeks and we're co-sponsors there. And, and again, encourage people to check that out if they're interested. But the Bermuda Monetary Authority, which is the financial regulator in Bermuda, they are super, um, you know, they are super sort of glued in and um, on top of how all of the technology works. They have an amazing um, sort of in in-house knowledge, technical knowledge, which then informs their regulation, which is typically extremely well thought through and considered, it's flexible. It, it brings about good outcomes. So yeah, couldn't couldn't sing their praises more. Um, we've been doing a fair bit of work also with Avara in Dubai, which is the virtual assets regulator right. in Dubai, uh, and they've just um, well, I mean, I say just about 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 twelve months or so ago, they you know they unveiled the, their new regulatory framework, and they've been doing loads of workshops and round tables with industry, like folks like me and others who get invited to talk to them about, you know, what we think is is sensible and workable about their proposals, where we think we might see friction or issues, what we've seen in other jurisdictions that they could consider adopting. Um, so I think they've, they've also been fantastic. Um, I mean, and, and then there are plenty of others, you know, that uh, I think uh, Gibraltar is another jurisdiction that's done, that's done very well. Um, and they have a great DLT licensing regime there, for example, which which also has a very big compliance component to it. Um, 
But no, look, I think I think the the long and short of it is there are plenty of places at the moment that are have have put in the work to to get regulatory clarity, some regulatory clarity anyway, and, and and in a good faith way, which gives entrepreneurs the opportunity to kind of put down some roots and begin to build things, which is already reaping benefits, you know, in terms of benefits to the local economy and 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 the value that it brings to the jurisdiction is immense. And I think if you compare that to, for example, the state in the US right now, where things are very fractious and unclear, and there have been a lot of efforts to pass new legislation to bring clarity to the regulatory and legislative um, framework. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet, and it's become very it's a very politicized topic um, in the US, unfortunately, uh, more than anywhere else in the world, I, I think, right now. Uh, and that's one of the things that's stopping it from progressing, in my view, is because it becomes very, it has become quite acrimonious and, and um, you know, it is not something which is dealt with in the same way across the aisle, let's put it like this. Um, and the longer that that state of affairs lasts, the more damaging it is to the US positioning itself as a leader in this kind of new web paradigm. Um, and to be honest, even back when I was at Outlier, and this is a few years ago now, we, you know, we would be getting advice from lawyers that projects were working with, and indeed our view also was that projects shouldn't establish themselves in the US because of because yeah. of that lack of clarity, because it just creates untenable sets of circumstances for the founders. And, you know, when you have regulators who you know, and this is this is um, something that is, is often levied against the current SEC. Um, you know, a desire to not interact in good faith. It then creates an environment where projects don't want to put up their hands and go and talk to the regulator because they they're, they're worried about what the consequences might be. Right. So actually, many projects now are either upping and leaving the US, or they're starting from outside the US in the first place, and they geo-block and they prevent US people from getting access to their, their their products and services, which is obviously not a good place to be for for American individuals who are you know are being precluded from accessing the technology that is transforming the internet. You didn't mention EU or the UK. <laughs> yes. Well. Okay. Well, I, and you're absolutely right. And thank you for for reminding me. So I think the UK. And I, I want to be diplomatic here. So I think the UK has just been a bit confused in the sense that I think it it talks a really good game, right? And the current, you know, the current PM and, and others are talking about how they want to make the UK a, a digital asset hub, which I think geopolitically is a sensible and smart thing for them to do, particularly post Brexit. Um, and indeed, there have been some consultation work that has been excellent. So, for example, the Treasury did a consultation paper. Um, Around this time last year, actually, uh, on on about how it could extend the current financial services regulatory regime to encompass Web three and digital assets, which was extremely well drafted and well thought through. And we did a response, and lots of other folks in the community did a did a response, um, which was fantastic and felt like a very you know excellent good faith interaction. Um, the Law Commission, also of England and Wales, released an amazing digital assets paper talking about how digital assets and the, the kind of English common law can interact together, particularly from the perspective of, of property, like private personal property rights, which is an amazing read. It's like 650 pages though. So there is like a summary that's about 15 or 20, which if you're interested, I, I think I'd start there. Um, so there's like a lot of really good work being done, but then in terms of being translated into practical, uh, you know, practical good outcomes for projects on the ground um, that we're seeing less of. I think it's still much more challenging than it should be, for example, to open a bank account for a Web3 organization in the UK, right? Then there are plenty of projects, even in our ecosystem that, you know, that their bank manager calls up one day and says, sorry, we need to um, close your account and they won't give a reason and you know they'll then try and open an account in 10 other places and they can't get an account open and I think that's a it's a serious pain point you know I think that's one example the other is there is currently a registration regime um, that's administered by the FCA in the UK if you yeah. want to run a digital asset business or the, and, and most types of digital asset businesses would fall into this regime you have to register with them the AML and counterterrorism finance purposes yeah. And that registration process has proven to be extraordinarily onerous and difficult for most 
project to succeed in many, 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 the vast majority actually, and I don't have the latest figures, so I don't want to misspeak, but a large majority were either refused or they decided just to give up the applications and, and establish themselves elsewhere because it was taking, you know, 12 to 18 months to get the process done. And if you're an early stage business, you can't wait that long to to get moving, unfortunately. So I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. They did just introduce in the UK um, a kind of financial services omnibus bill that also um, envisages stable coins being kind of integrated into a bunch of the payments services kind of rails and infrastructure in the UK, which is exciting because I think stable coins potentially quite a good use case back to our earlier point. Um, but yeah, so the UK complicated kind of in typical UK fashion. Um, and then uh, Europe and, and Mika, I mean, I think again, Mika, you know, there's there's strengths and potential weaknesses to to the approach. Right? I think it makes a lot of sense to focus regulation on, you know, large centralized service providers that interact with the technology, but also take custody of assets and often do a bunch of other things at the same time. Um, and, in, and in general terms, maybe to kind of leave DeFi, as it's called, or you know, truly decentralized things out of that regulatory perimeter. But of course, there is a big exercise at the moment to think about how to extend Mika to cover also the the, the kind of more quote unquote decentralized components of um, of the industry. And of course, as with all of these things, you know, as Mika implementation rolls around, the the, the devil will be in the detail um, in, in in many different respects in terms of of what the practical impact is for projects that are trying to be compliant. But I think there there is at least a clear path for projects to register and also for projects to, for example, launch digital assets if that's what they want to do. And, and I think that's a great launching off point um, globally. And there are, you know, many of the other jurisdictions that I've mentioned have borrowed some elements of Mika in some of their own kind of local law implementations. So it shows you that there's, you know, there is good stuff in there. Um, of course, I think having a harmonized regime across all of the different European member states is a great thing. You know, passporting where you can get approved in one state and then offer goods and services throughout the whole EU is a hugely powerful thing for projects. And I think provided the uh, the implementation details are consistent enough across member states because they do have some discretion to decide how they actually implement this in their national law, um, I think it could be you know, net positive, but I think it still remains to be um, to be seen. And there are also, you know, it's not just Mika, by the way, there's also the kind of transfer of funds and AML regulations as well that are in play at the moment. There was a lot of um, fury on um, crypto Twitter the last few days about exactly the EU allegedly banning self-hosted wallets, which is not in fact what was going on. And we can we can touch on that if, if you like, but I think- Yeah, definitely. It, you know, I it think just that's, shows that's... How, how kind of complicated- yeah. Because all of these issues are so nuanced and complicated, it's yeah. very difficult. Um, so, well, look, put it this way, it's very hard to get it right the first time, but I think you know, Mika and indeed some of these other legislation packages, in most cases, I think are a good faith effort to try and balance you know, policy outcomes and, and protection of, of individuals and, and, and investors and other, um, other things with the, you know, allowing people the freedom to innovate. And that's kind of the balance that we're always trying to strike. So what's the you know what's your view on the the topic which is the unhosted wallets you know the transactions you know the the what supposedly was rolled out at the EU level? Yeah, sure. So so um, and I'm and I'm still playing catch up here. Um, but right. my my current understanding, right, is that um, towards the end of last week there was a bunch of um, articles flying around that said you know latest news EU bans self-hosted wallets basically. I mean, which I think took a lot of people by surprise, including myself, yeah. by the way. That that seems, um, to be honest, that seems a little bit unlikely and aggressive. But you know, yeah. I'm going to try and find out more. Um, and I think having um, dug into the detail, and also as as did plenty of others, and and some of whom immediately kind of went to to the, the Twitter trenches to to try and combat that the panic that was unfolding everywhere. Um, what was actually announced is part of this kind of AML package of, of legislation, which talks about the obligations that so-called obliged entities have under this legislation. And these are organizations that, to which the AML um, obligations actually attach themselves. And in the Web3 context, that's going to typically be ASPs, um, you know, central asset, um, centralized um, service providers. And the need for them when they are offering wallets and other types of digital asset services to undertake 
AML KYC checks. You can't provide services to people that you haven't put through those processes. And in addition, um, and this is something that, again, has been in the legislation for a little while, um, so-called privacy coins, which deliberately, you know, by their mechanism, obfuscate the identity of the network participants and make it almost impossible to identify um, individuals behind kind of public key, you know, hashes um, are also prohibited. So I think that's, you know, I can see where they're coming from with that positioning. And again, this doesn't mean that self-hosted wallets are illegal because, you know, self-hosted wallets that are operated by individuals are not covered by these obligations, just to be super duper clear, um, which is, is appropriate to me. And I think it's also appropriate that if you're a centralized provider of these types of services, you should be subject to some degree of KYC AML obligations in order to get the policy outcomes that we talked about. Um, but I do think that privacy is a very delicate issue. And I think if you look at some of the other technical implementations that exist in Web3 already, like zero knowledge proofs, for example, um, and multi-party computation, where you can you can prove that a certain set of circumstances is true and correct without actually having to expose the data, un the underlying data that, that corroborates it. So for example, you could use zero knowledge proof to prove that I am the age that I say I am, or I'm above a certain age or below a certain age, or that I'm a citizen of a certain country, or I have a bank account at a certain bank, without me having to send you like copies of my bank statements or a copy of my passport or these types of things, which you know is very much the current paradigm still. You know, if if you're an an obliged entity or you know an organization to whom you know these types of obligations. Um, attach, you know, you will be very familiar with having to do these types of checks and saying, hey, I need to see a copy of your ID document. I need you to send me that. I need you to send me a proof of address that's usually a utility bill that's less than three months old and all of these types of things. And I think that's, again, you can see why those systems exist from a policy outcome perspective, but equally we have technology to, to now do that process in a better way that doesn't create these kind of large honeypots of, of personal data that are flying around the internet. And, and this stuff is super sensitive. And if it gets breached, um, you know, it can ruin. Yeah, I think what, what was lives. happening, you know, historically is like you had to provide certain documents, right? In order yeah. to, you know, present yourself, you know, and store the data and mm -hmm. have the audit trail, all this stuff. Right now that this artifacts exist still, they're kind of, Oh, you need to provide, you know, uh, you need to provide your your passport copy, right? Yeah. Historically, you just needed data, and the passport was kind of the proof of the data, right? Mm -hmm. But right now, you have the passport, which is kind of the data, right? Yeah, the artifact. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that's that's interesting. I think you know that we actually right now we have the re regulators which forgot the the original purpose of this, um, you know, requirements. So yes. We have a couple of discussions right now, which which kind of you know shows that okay, this is this is not so easy to explain. A hundred percent. I mean, and I think that goes to, you know, like for example, zero knowledge proof technology is extraordinarily complicated, right? Yeah. And I don't I don't profess to understand all the ins and outs, but I don't have a PhD in in maths, you know, or cryptography. So I, I to be honest, I probably wouldn't be able to. But I think the important point. When you know when we're working with and talking to regulators and lawmakers is to help them understand the nuance a little bit more, and also help them to understand that some of the features of the technology, like the fact that it's open and transparent yeah. and missionless, is that potentially actually a huge strength that they could also rely on, that helps them get to policy outcomes that they want in a way that preserves privacy better. But also often in a way that probably is cheaper and more efficient yeah. as well. So it means they can spend less money, you know, kind of trying to preserve trust and also protect all of these you know, huge honeypots of data that have got, you know, millions of copies of passports and driver's licenses and yeah. bank statements and all these types of things, which, you know, as we know, very regularly get exposed, unfortunately. So I think there is just a, a better way in our view. Yeah, no, definitely. So... You know, we are at the moment in bull market, right? You know, we I think it's well, it's coming coming up. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah, do, where do you think we are in this in the in the cycle? Oh, that's a well, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, so I guess um, obviously not 
financial, I mean, all legal advice. I should have said that yeah. at the beginning. Actually, none of this is, is legal or financial advice, and it's just my personal views. Um, why do I think we are in the cycle? Oh, look, I think it's a great question. It depends who you ask. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks would say that depending let on- me, Let uh, me reverse this, right? You okay. know, so one of the things that we also is the out, outflow of, you know, developers from mm. the ecosystem, right? Mm. When there was a winter, do you see developers coming back? Um, to uh, the ecosystem? Yeah. I think that's it's a, that's one a great... of the indi indicator where we are, right? Yes. So I was going to say, you know, we, we don't think about market cycles necessarily in that way, right? We, we look at fundamentals and we look at the technology yeah. that's being built and the usage at the protocol and application level, which has been, you know, growing extremely fast for our ecosystem. So for example, yes, our, our monthly active developer count is growing, but I think more, even more significantly, our monthly active user number has been growing extraordinarily um, over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. So we now have... Um, a little over 14 million monthly active users across 40 million 14 million wow. 14 million that's so that's uh across three or four of the largest dApps on the planet so it, we have i think in the top six or seven on dap radar we have four of the largest dApps currently in in the near ecosystem which which, which are those so we have um but the, the biggest, um, by by some margin, is a, 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 an app called um, Kaiching, Cosmos Kaiching, which is a shopping mm -hmm. uh, shopping loyalty um, um, platform and, and ecosystem. Um, and it's also embedded on the lock screens of Android phones, of some Android phones. Um, and so they get a lot of users. And the, the experience is, you know, if you look at advertising and other things that, that you know, have th things that you're interested in, you can get points that then allow you to get discounts and other types of things. Um, for the stuff that you might want to buy, and you can also kind of see and control how your data is being used um, and can and control it. Um, uh, that's and, built on Cosmos, right? Uh, or... it, it's no, it's built on. That's actually built on the Near Protocol, and they right. and they moved. So they moved their payment rails from Stripe, a Web two implementation, to the Near Protocol because it was an order of magnitude cheaper for them to do it. Right. So, so to run these okay. transactions, the Near Protocol right. is significantly less expensive than than Stripe would charge. Yeah. Um, another great project is Sweat um, and the Sweat Economy. So that's a kind of move to earn um, application where you download it onto your phone. It tracks the number of steps that you take and you, you earn the native Sweat um, token cryptocurrency. Um, you know, the, the more you move, the more you earn, which is which is great. Um, they also have millions of monthly active um, users. We have um, Play Ember, which is a, a gaming platform, a, a kind mm -hmm. of hyper casual um, mobile gaming platform. And they have a lot of really exciting things in the pipeline, actually. Um, so watch this space for them. And then the last one that's you know that that I'll mention on top of my head is um, is Here Wallet um, and and Hot, which is a, another kind of gaming platform, but also a it's like a gamified wallet platform and and, and launch pad. And they also have. Um, millions of monthly active users and it, it also their wallet actually works as a telegram bot so within telegram and, and they, they only launched it about i'd say probably two months ago and so they went from you know basically not existing to having millions of, of users in the space of a couple of months which is an amazing demonstration of yeah. the path the, like the scaling power of the of the technology and um, which is which is great but i should stress as well because you know i think you, you asked earlier you know what's the like what's happening in the near ecosystem at the moment, and right now, where you know the ecosystem as a whole, and there's a bunch of different nodes that are working on this endeavor together, um, is working on something called chain abstraction. Mm. And the idea of this um, initiative is to abstract away the complexity of blockchain infrastructure and blockchain experiences. So by that, I mean. That um, you know, right now, if if you spent any time in Web three, you would you would know that you have to have, for example, you know, manage seven different wallet clients on seven seven different blockchains. You have to bridge assets and move them around. It's super complicated. It's very hard. And my grandma could definitely not do that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the acid test. Like, could my grandma use this stuff? Because if we want the, these technologies to be being used by a billion people, 
they have to be super easy to use and they have to be easier to just as easy to use as these things that we you know that we use every day so that's the idea that we're trying to abstract away the the, the underlying complexity and make it super easy for users to, to kind of do stuff in web3 and the way that we do that is is with something called account aggregation and what that means basically is that you can manage all of your web3 experiences and assets regardless of where they might be sitting through your near account so from one place so rather than having to switch and to bridge and all this kind of stuff that all goes out the window you just use your near account which which by the way maps to human readable addresses rather than um public transaction hashes yeah. so like you could have fris.near or pav, you know pavel.near or whatever could be your address and through that you can manage all of your different digital asset experiences and and, and assets etc and so that's the that's the current um, big product push that the ecosystem is working on and we're super excited about because we think we can become the connective tissue to unify a lot of these different um, ecosystems and experiences that are currently quite siloed and and separated from one another. Um, and then when you're a user or when you're a, a developer or a founder, you have to make a lot of trade-offs when you decide where you want to set up shop. You know, do I want to build? in the near ecosystem or do I want to build in Polkadot or in Polygon or right. and when you're a when you're a founder, you, you have to make a bunch of trade-offs where it'd be like, oh well look, I, I love the near technology and developer experience because we're, we're very well known for, for having a great one. But you know, um I want to be able to access all of the uh, I don't know the 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 investors and liquidity that are in the Solana ecosystem right now because that's really exciting. There's lots of money coming into that. But I also want to be able to I don't know get some some functionality from Ethereum and their stack. And right now it's very hard for you to do that without just picking one and compromising on those other elements. Mm. And with chain abstraction and, and account aggregation, we hope that you you know you just won't need to do that anymore. Yeah. I think you know the point on user experience is is very valid because I think you know we actually done terrible work uh, in Web three on you know <laughs> user very terrible. experience. Very that's, terrible. That's something, but it's I've been in this you know in this ecosystem for ten years and I still have problems yeah. with like basic problems with setting up properly. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the 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 wallet, you know. So totally. It's, Totally. It's, it's um, very interesting, you know, so yeah. That, yeah we have yeah. to do better. If someone you know, gets to, this right, you know, it's going to be the winner, you know. I, I agree. And I think we, you know, we, we talked a lot about, about you know, what, what does the open web mean for people? You know, what, is, what, what does it look like? And I think at the moment, people tend to prioritize convenience and ease of use over yeah. more kind of heady esoteric ideas of privacy or data ownership. They kind of like, I don't care. I just want to like, I want my Amazon yeah. stuff to one time. I want, you know, my delivery, whatever it is. And I think if you want to bring people into this new web paradigm, you, you know, we have to make it easy and we have to make the experience competitive with the current web two kind of experience, which is, which is super seamless and, you know, incredible and easy to use. And to your point, like if, if, if anyone's tried to use, you know, uh, most of the like wallet solutions out there or try to, I don't know, recover a wallet with your secret, you know, um, key phrase and stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare that most people will, will not want to do or bother to. <laughs> out of I, can, I can tell you some of the funny stories, which I had, you know, with, with my wallets, you know, lost wallets, you know, where yeah. I tried to, you know, this, do the staking and, you know, the staking do not exist, you know, so that's. That's totally, or like you know, the ledger wallets and 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 you know, re yeah. and the 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 secret recovery phrase on a ledger wallet. I love ledger and that they're, they're great, but I mean, you know, using two little buttons to select <laughs> all out the bed of words is is like yeah. a, you know, some people will know what I'm talking about. Um, is just needlessly painful, and and again, yeah. we we can do better. Maybe one one uh, feature of that um, ch uh, sort of chain abstraction account aggregation piece that I think is just worth sharing because I think it might be of interest to some of your listeners is we have this thing called fast auth, which is a, a, a little kind of product feature that allows um, applications to create accounts in less than a second. And they're secured using biometric pass keys, you know, face ID or thumbprints. Mm. And so, so you can create a Web3 wallet, which is your near account, which yeah. as I said, you can then interact with all of your other Web3 stuff through eventually. Um, in less than a second, and exactly the same way that you would create, 
you know, like a Google account or a delivery account. You tap one button on your phone, it scans your face. That's how it's secured. And then you have a Web3 wallet, but it works exactly like a Web2 experience would. Do so you have the, any seat you can create? Because then, you know, I don't know. You can. You, Absolutely. So you, can, go... you can do all of the usual bells and whistles if you want right. to. But there is also an email recovery if you want it that's done in a way that uses multi-party computation and some other things to keep, um, you know, to, to maintain that level of security. But it it gives people, let's call it the kind of less complex onboarding path versus what exists currently where, you know, you're right. Some people want to, they want to write down their secret um, recovery phrase. They want to put it in a, in a bank vault somewhere so that it can never be accessed. Um, but that isn't, you know, that's not how you get to mass adoption, unfortunately. And considering your your experience, I have question question which is uh, related to the VC approach versus um, let's say I think what's what's happening in the in the crypto ecosystem. So mm. VC approach would be focus on one thing, perfect it, deliver, right? And then you have crypto world, which is kind of you know, we build this massive thing, you know, and I tell you, I mean, the funny, funny conclusion, which I had, you know, recently is like, I don't know any blockchain, which says we're building for institutional clients to actually work along any institutional clients, right. To understand mm -hmm. their problem. Mm -hmm. So they, they create something, they said, oh, this is going to be for institutional client having zero institutional clients. Right. So I think, you know, this is, so what's your view, you know, where is like the, the you know, the, the focus versus big thing and yeah. change which we need to instigate to actually make the big thing happen? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think it's another great question. There's, a, there's lots of things tied up in, into it, right? I think the first thing I would say is the biggest challenge for any Web3 organization uh, pretty much is, is focus. Right. Right, if you're in Web3, you'll know like the, the things move so fast and the trends come and go and focus and interest come and go. And I think the biggest thing that you can do as a as a Web3, you know, founder or builder or whatever is to maintain focus. And, you know, if, if you've established what you think will be valuable, you, you try and stay focused on that and not get distracted. It's very hard to do, though. Um, and it's the first part. And I think the second part is you're right for organizations that are helping to support ecosystems of this technology, indeed it can be hard to, you know, avoid falling into the trap where this technology tries to be everything to everyone. And in so doing is kind of nothing to anyone, or that's the risk that you run. Um, and I think it's fair to say that in a lot of respects, aside from the kind of hyper financialization of things, which I think has has has, has proven to be a a use case with some product market fit. You can dispute how much and what the value of it is, but nonetheless, I think there is a clear product market fit. Um, aside from that, and maybe um, kind of cross-border settlement and and just you know payments in general, um, I think mm -hmm. Web3 is still searching, to, to your point, for the kind of the killer use case. There are so many nascent things, they just don't have the level of adoption that you see in Web2. Um, but I, I think that over the next 12 to 18 months could be the period of time when, you know, we see some of those use cases really coming to the fore and, and exploding from a kind of scale perspective. Um, and we think that that's one of the things that will begin to move the needle and bring the whole industry into mainstream adoption. You know, when you go from tens of millions of users like, you know, that exist currently in Web3 and, and you start pushing to the hundreds of millions, that's a, you know that's an order of magnitude difference and i think that's when there will be much more significant change i think it's also going to be when a lot of these pain points between how the technology functions and how regulation and compliance currently exists and operates will probably be amplified and and we'll need to work very hard to sort those out because it's always harder to do those things um at scale but like I said, I think there's a lot of positives and, and I think the industry is making amazing progress. And of course, it's been a long period of time where from a kind of pure markets perspective, there has been less interest. It's been harder for projects to raise money. Um, you know, it's been harder for projects to convince um, people that they're not insane for building in Web3, for example. But I think we're kind of, to your point, we're coming out of that difficult, more, more challenging period and into one where it's becoming a bit 
easier and more straightforward for projects to to build and get funding and visibility and excitement. Um, but there's still a huge amount of work to do. Um, but but in you know that's partly what what our organization is is here to is you know exactly here to do, which is to sort of support the the growth and development of open web technologies in general. Um, and uh, I'm super excited to see you know what happens the next 12, 18 months, but also um, beyond. And do you, do you think, last question, do you think um, comparing AI and Web3, mm-hmm. right? My feeling is that Web3 is actually freedom and there's a lot of like liberty, you know, mm-hmm. um, pure, let's say, capitalism almost uh, happening, right? Where mm-hmm. in AI, you have this locked ecosystems right now run by big, big players. And we're going to see incredible stuff coming out, but you know where normal people would be, let's say, moving a needle, right? It's actually mm. Web three. Mm. So I think, agree? well, I think. Do you see any AI projects which are kind of small teams, not immediately acquired, building something which could be challenging? I think there is a. I think I think Web three creates infrastructure and a potential economy where that can be true. Okay. Because you can have, you know, you can have these open economies that don't that they're not centrally controlled or administered and, and they can create economic value and potentially sustainable business models in a way that you don't have to rely on Microsoft coming and buying you out, you know, 10 minutes into right. your into your founder journey. Um and I think we definitely we think that blockchain and AI, you know, they belong together, particularly when you think about, you know, the I don't know, we we've talked a bit about this, but you know, misinformation, for example, you know, the, the scale of it, I think it's hard for people to appreciate, but with these new AI models that can churn out convincing misinformation, for example, it's going to become an absolutely enormous problem. And, and one of the best ways to authenticate information is to use Web3 technology. Um, but so more you, generally, it's a human, human proof, something like this? But p- potentially. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you could do it, but I think the advantage, you, you know, the advantage that, that blockchains have is that they can, you know, they can authenticate provenance of things potentially yeah. i think you can and, and there are lots of different projects trying to do this in different ways whether you're like wrapping ai in a, in a kind of web3 casing so that anything that comes out of it is has got some kind of um verifiable source and and associated data around its creation for example um but i think more generally on the on the question of of like the the current ai paradigm you're right it's a very small number of enormous players with incredible amounts of money building remarkable products you know don't get me wrong things are absolutely incredible and they will mm-hmm. so you know certainly change um the way that everything. many have done yeah, yeah. Probably, exactly probably yeah. everything but they are being created and their value is being accrued in that pri- in that closed permissioned paradigm that you mentioned right which we think is quite dangerous because ultimately a lot of the issues that you see with the current closed web, they'll be repeated and maybe even amplified in this yeah. kind of closed AI paradigm. And so we are hopeful that there will be robust, you know, truly open alternatives to what currently exists in, in the AI space. And and actually Ilya, who's the CEO of the foundation, one of the yeah. co-founders of the protocol, he's the co-author of the um, original Transformers paper where it's called Attention is All You Need. And so he and we are working on some very interesting initiatives that over the next few months, we're going to begin to announce and unveil that we think are going to help on that kind of path to to open, um, you know, provably and irrevocably open AI um, implementations. Excellent. So this is something that, you know, worth waiting for, for sure. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. We'll keep we'll keep you uh, we'll keep you posted. Chris, thank you very much for this. Pleasure. You too, Pavel. Great to be here. Thanks again for for the invite. Crypto compliance brought to you by Gate Knox.